By the time the sun hits the horizon, we're almost to Heart Mountain. And then we set up our camp, and the next morning we're ready to enjoy some of the hot water of the hot springs at the hot springs camp at Heart Mountain. There are about th uh, three pools outside and one pool inside. You have to look for them, but if you go across that travertine mound, you'll come to some of them that are pretty darn good. Sometimes the Huge inside pool is a little built crowded. Like the ruins of an old shack, which would be so common out here. Rocks were plentiful, so most of the old homestead houses were built of rock. We get ready, and we're going to try one of the outdoor pools. It is where the hot water comes flowing out of the ground, and volunteers have built a pool and even put some cement blocks in for seats. The sagebrush is in bloom, and we're enjoying the warm weather of the outdoors. During the night, we were woken by the sound of hooves tramping around outside. We look over on a nearby hill, and there the culprits were, a little herd of mule deer that walked right by our camp. We get in the enclosed pool, and we're the only ones here this morning. And wow, is that water neat. And there's even a metal ladder leads down into it. We so do our morning soak, and then we remembered our time is running out. We don't have that much time, and we have to get going. Just beyond the headquarters of the refuge, we see our first antelope, a nice big buck with nice shiny horns. He's just standing looking at us. He's in the safety area around the refuge headquarters, so he doesn't have to worry about a rifle sticking out the window and, sh and shooting dust all over him. They are in the heat of rut in this area, so we don't have to worry about them running off too much. They're kind of stupid right at this time of year. But wow, what a beauty he is with that black nose and those black shiny antlers and the nice ladder right up his throat. He is one nice big antelope. We go on. And here's another. We, when we reached this spot, we saw an antelope running, and we had interrupted an antelope fight. And the one that's running is not running from us. He's running from another big antelope that had just beat him up. He hurries across the road and over into the desert on the other side. Then he looks ahead and sees the other buck, and he figures he'd just as well go in that fight right now and have it over with. So he'll run over and lope off. Intimidate is a big part of this. If you can intimidate somebody by looking tough and mean, why bother wasting the energy for a fight? And besides, you might get scratched up and pushed around a little bit. And the, these antelope are at it all day long. So they get really foot sore and tired after the rut goes on a while. He reaches his little group of does, and they've already spread out while he was fighting. And so he's got to herd them all back over and get them together again. And there goes that darn rascal that was causing all the trouble. He'll have to go over and work him over again. They kick up a little dust as they come together, and he's going to chase that other buck away. Besides, he's getting way too close to that doe, so he needs to have his 
Little tail end kicked and kicked good. The does seem to think this is just the way things are, and they don't seem to be doing reacting much at all. They just do what the old buck tells them and get back in their little group and stand and look. Uh-oh, that other guy's coming too close again, so he's got to be run off again. And maybe those does will just stay there like they're told till he gets back from running the other buck off. He's kicking up a little dust just to make him look meaner. The two rivals come together again, and they play the little game of, oh, I didn't see anybody there. That's probably what they tell the does when they ask why they didn't get in another antelope fight. The one buck is putting his scent on the sagebrush. They have little scent glands right up the black patch on their chin is a little scent gland, and they'll rub it on the sagebrush to leave their scent. And then the next buck that comes along knows that he isn't in the place where he should be. They can't fight all the time, but just most of the time. And if intimidation doesn't work, maybe an antelope fight will help. He's already kind of winded, so he just walks over to where his opponent is. And the opponent's supposed to run, but sometimes they'll decide to stand around and hold their ground. He's sneaking up behind him, and he's going to give him a good working over if he doesn't pack up his bags and get over the top of that hill. And besides, there's a little doe there that he has to try to impress. Heart Mountain Antelope Refuge was started up to protect these antelope, and so there's a fair amount of them around in in the desert of Heart Mountain Refuge. And it seems like antelope season was just over with. And so these bucks escaped the bullets of antelope hunter's rifles. And it looks like there's plenty of bucks out here. Well, that guy is going to avoid a fight. But maybe he just as well run on over there. It looks like the one buck's already getting foot sore. From there, we move on. And some cattle are out in the road. A couple of calves right in the road in front of us. We go through French Glen. And then we decide to stop here at the base of the Steens Mountains. And see the old peach French Pete French Long Barn. This is a huge old barn, and it, the, it looks like it's needing a new roof pretty badly because the old shingles have withstood the weather of the desert for too many years. An old wagon is still in here. But after Pete French had to be shot by a homesteader who he was pestering, he would intimidate the homesteaders and try to run them out. And sometimes he went to court and he had the judges in the area pretty much in his pocket. But he didn't have any luck intimidating one homesteader. His last name was Oliver. And when Pete French went up to ask him when he was going to leave, he put a bullet right between Pete French's eyes on a early frosty morning. When we came up, we saw a great horned owl take off out of the barn, and also there were some deer tracks where they moved into the edge of the barn. That's probably pretty nice to, to use that barn for protection and shelter. It was used, the hay wagon would go down the center of the barn and cowboys would be 
on the hay wagon pitching hay and both sides off the hay wagon. We look around the area and we see numerous owl balls. This is feathers and bones and uh, hair and all sorts of things that the owls can't digest and they spit them out. And we saw them all around from the great horned owl. Next, we go to the winch, which was used. They would butcher a beef a week, and there were enough people here during Pete French's time working on the ranch to eat a beef a week, and it was hauled up on this wooden winch and then butchered and fed to the hundreds of cowboys that were working on the ranch. From there, we go about 16 miles to the top of the Steens Mountains, and we're going to camp at Fish Lake, right in the quaking Aspen Grove. The old beaver have been here, and they've really been working these quaking aspen over. They were cutting some and just leaving them away. I don't know why these beaver were so wasteful, but that's what they were doing. And then they'd pack what they wanted down to the, to the fish lake and bury them and have them for winter. We decided to go down to fish lake and test the water and see if it really is a fish lake. We'd make the short hike from the campground down to the fishing hole, bait our hooks and throw out, and we no more than get our hooks out there, and the fish were biting, and they were good size this time of year. A lot of these fish have been planted in here in the, in the spring, and so they've had all summer to get really nice and big. And so we're going to see if we can catch us a fish feed right in the choppy waters of Fish Lake. And here comes our first one in. And that made a stab at him and finally got him. And there he is, a nice rainbow trout. And so we've got one fish for dinner. Now if we can catch a few more, we'll have all we need. Marge proudly shows off her trout. And then, just as fast as you could throw your hook out, you were catching them just one right after another. There was a brisk breeze blowing in the high altitude of Fish Lake, but I guess the fish didn't mind because they're biting, and they kept breaking their hooks, and so I spent all my time tying new hooks on and untangling line, but anyway, we caught all the fish we could possibly want for our fish feed and even found a few that we brought home. There, Annette and Marge are very proudly showing off their fish. We fillet them out and put them in the skillet with a little cornmeal, and wow, that is one great fish feed. I guess the open air and being a little hungry make them taste all the better. So we're going to have fish and rice for dinner, and that is really hard to beat. Cottage cheese. Here's some cheese, Parmesan cheese. Here we go. And Thank you. No more? That's enough, I guess. Okay. I'll have some fish oh. now. Okay. So we're having our fish feed right in a little aspen grove 
and that is a really good feed. We have our fish feed, and the next thing we know, we look skyward, and it's starting to be a really super nice sunset. It was so nice in the aspen. They smelled so good, and they make such a neat sound as they quake in it. The next morning, we're up early, and we're heading out. We're heading to the summit of the steams. We come across a sheep herder with his band of sheep. They're along the road, and apparently he had to keep them from crossing the road in front of him. Maybe part of that was private property and other parts of it weren't. There are even some black sheep in the herd. The friendly young sheep herder was from Peru and didn't speak English. But that's all right because Annette knows Spanish and so she'll talk to him in his native language. After the sheep, we move on up ahead to look out over Tiger Gorge Canyon. This is a canyon that was cut by glaciers and so it's a classical U-shaped canyon. When they're eroded out from water, they're V-shaped. But when a glacier carves them, they're U-shaped. And so here's about the best example you've ever seen of a U-shaped canyon, even with a little gun sight pass in the background. There's a very stiff breeze blowing up here. I was guessing it was 40 or 50 miles an hour at least. And so we don't stand very close to the cliffs of the edge because a good gust of wind could push you over the side. We can see the canyon far down below us and a little stream running right down the center of the bottom of it. And what a nice place. A few little groves of a little bit of brush and a few quake and aspen. Then we go back down where the sheep herder was. Here comes one of these herding dogs. They usually use border collies, but sometimes they use others. And he needs a lot of dog power. Were you into the sun, Tom? Did it, did it make a click? No, uh, yeah, it did, yeah. Did it do it? Yeah. Oh, it, oh yeah, there yeah, it is. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, yeah. 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 The Peruvian sheep herder has the whole family along, which is a lot of dogs, some border collies, one white herding dog, and then a bunch of the sheep dogs that think they're sheep. They have very little human intervention, and they stay with the sheep, and they think they're a sheep, and they chase away predators. We ask about the predators, and he said they chase coyotes all the time. But they hadn't chased any of the Grandi cats. That would be the mountain lions. We go on up and look over. It's a little hazy today, but we're looking over toward the Albert Desert. We see Man Lake and a circular irrigation system, one of the pivot systems of Man Lake. Then we look out over the desert for a long ways, and we see Coyote Lake where Annette's 160 acres are. It's the playa out in the far background. By the time we reach the summit of the Steens Mountains, it's 9,000 some feet. The wind is blowing so much you can barely stand up. We'd plan to go down to Wild Horse Lake, but it's just so windy we were afraid to tackle the cliffs of going down there. 
The wind was blowing rocks around, and we've had rocks tumble down near us on other occasions as we were going down to Wild Horse Lake. So we'll go on and see if we can find us something else to do. We're going to take the Steens Mountain Loop, and we see they've repaired the road on the south part of the Steens Mountains Loop. So we move on down till we come to a okay. ranch. It says, Fred Riddle's original cabin was built prior to 1990, screened in porch and separate bunkhouse, also known as Honeymoon or Cook's Cabin, were added later. The ranch's setting and historical structures remind us of the thousands of homesteaders that settled the northern Great Basin between 1900 and 1920, building homes and lives in the semi-arid lands of the West. They conjure up images of simpler times of homemade housing with handcrafted furniture lit by candles or kerosene. For this reason, the Bureau of Land Management acquired the Riddle Brothers Ranch property from the Clemens family in 1986, designated 1,120 acre historic district, and undertook active stabilization and restoration of the buildings. In typical fashion, Fred, Ben, and Walt Riddle started small but continued to enlarge their spread over the years. While they spent their entire lives together, each brother lived in his own cabin. Outbuildings reflected the ranch's haying and livestock operations. Willow, cor willow corrals and a large barn initially held mules, horses, sheep, and in later years cattle. A blacksmith shop enabled on-site repairs of ranch equipment and tools. In addition to buildings, the brothers acquired a collection of horse-drawn farm machinery, buggies, and wagons. In most ways, the brothers had to make do with what was on hand. After a hard day's work, books, a record player, or the radio offered the evening's entertainment accompanied by a tumbler of moonshine from the brothers still. Oh, it, takes so, it takes grit, self-reliance, and a taste for solitude to homestead country like Steens Mountain. The Riddle brothers had those and more. For 50 years, they called this valley home, and by the time they died, had built an impressive ranch. Walt, Fred, and Ben Riddle had homesteading in their blood. Paternal grandparents William and Maximilla traveled the Oregon and Applegate trails to settle in southern Oregon. Parents Tobias and Sarah moved with her family to Harney County in 1872, but soon returned to the Umpqua River country. While their parents had abandoned eastern Oregon, the Bachelor brothers made it home. Ben arrived in 1896, followed several years later by Walt and Fred. Much of the arable land in the lowlands of Harney County was already claimed, but they found property in this well-watered valley at the mouth of the Little Blitzen Gorge. The ranch produced 150 tons of hay annually from flood irrigated fields along the Little Blitzen River and sold mules and horses to the U.S. Cavalry. After World War I, livestock changed to cattle. As the ranch business manager, Walt often traveled to Burns and Winnemucca. Fred was content to oversee day-to-day -day operations. Ben was 47 when he died in 1927. Walt, the eldest, died in 1950. A few years before he died at the age of 85, Fred sold the ranch to the Clemens family of Philomath, Oregon. The Clemens family, with caretakers Glenn and Helen Davis, managed the ranch until BLM acquired it in, 1890, 18, in 1986. Okay, there. Fred Riddle was a homebody and avid reader. He reportedly kept up to 40 cats, serving them three gallons of milk each morning and evening. An old cottonwood tree. It must have taken a bolt of lightning. And it's killed it and burned it. Looks like the lightning bolt just split the bark and came right down the, to the trunk of the tree. There is a very dedicated woman working as the host at the Riddle Ranch. She, they get to live in one of the cabins. And so they get to uh, enjoy the area much as it was back many many years ago this woman is from england and she had two other women over here that had just recently arrived here from england and they were really having a great time being out in the wide open spaces and enjoying the scenery of the steens mountains There's 
the cook stove and the bones appear to be deer leg bones and there was one beef ankle bone and they recently did a dig on the old root cellar and found these down in the bottom probably they'd hang their meat there and whenever they wanted a piece of meat to cook for dinner they'd go out and cut them off the steaks they wanted and then probably just threw the bones down on the floor of the root cellar where they have laid for so many years. There were still plenty of deer around and it, this proves that they did eat deer. Some of the old homesteaders wouldn't eat deer meat. They wanted nice fat beef but apparently these guys enjoyed the great meat of the venison, which probably were all over the place eating their irrigated pasture. The cupboards had screen over the door to keep the flies off their dishes, and all the porch and all the doors had screens on them. Apparently there were plenty of mosquitoes. There's even an old oil stove in their living room where they could set with some moonshine from their stills and maybe read a book or listen to the radio. There's even an upstairs in it, and this must be where they slept, in the attic part of it. There's even an old metal bed up here. These kind of beds, the metal beds, you probably are better off not to be sleeping in them when there's a lightning storm. Some old wagon wheels decorate the entrance to the house, and we see all their little sheds out in front. There was even a little milk house with an old cream separator in it. Apparently, they separated the milk, and I'll bet those cats got the separated milk not that with the cream there's even laundry tubs in it to wash the separator and their milk buckets and i don't know where the cat dishes were i'll bet they were right out front and i'll bet you those cats lined up every day at milking time wondering where their milk is we went in the blacksmith shop and found a variety of different things in the shop that apparently they had been working on. The old forge was missing, but there were still a few things in there. And out front, we saw an old horse-drawn mowing machine. Some mushrooms are growing on some poles out in front. And then numerous outbuildings. The little building on the right was their honeymoon cook's cabin. And then an old, looks like something to use to plow the snow in front of their walkways. And an old Fresno or slip was setting out front that you'd probably hook a pretty heavy horse onto. And you could clean irrigation ditches or dig ponds. The house is made of rusty lumber, and there are wood stove in each house, another metal bed, and there's what you took a bath in on Saturday night. We see one more of the Riddle Brothers cabin with even a cellar. We move on and find the wild horses. These are the Kiger horses, and they're it's claimed that the descendants of these horses are the real Spanish Mustang, particularly the Palominos, and they were raised on an island down in Florida, and some of them were transported up here. There's other stories that the Spaniards came riding up here on a group of horses, and the Indians killed all the Spanish and took the horses. They didn't know what to do with the horses. They didn't know how to ride at that time, so they just turned them loose. And supposedly that's where the Spanish Mustangs came from up here. 
but I don't buy that story. I have a totally different theory, but it does make an interesting story, all right. But whatever the story, these horses are wild and free to do as they want and wander high into the Steens Mountains and water at the water hole of their choice. They've never had a rope, a bridle, or a saddle or a harness on them. Then we move on, and it's getting that time of year when the cowboys are moving their cattle down from the high country down into their hay pastures where they've got their hay put up, and they'll graze on the hay, the stubble of the hay fields until winter comes. When the snows come, then they'll feed them some of the hay they've put up on the hay fields. This is a way of life for these people which they enjoy. We arrive at White Horse Hot Springs just as the keeper of the stars is getting the sun put away for the evening. But hey, we've got time to try that nice hot water in White Horse Hot Springs, and wow, is it great. And Marge is wearing her hat, too. The, ne the next morning, we move out early, past Annette's desert property on Coyote Lake. She has 160 acres out here and then to the Charbonneau gravesite. John Baptiste Charbonneau, as a baby, was with his mother, Shakajouia, a member of the Lewis and Clark expedition. As a man, was a pioneer of the West, of pleasant manner and esteem in the community. Placed by Malheur Chapter D.A.R., August 6, 1971. Okay, and what does that say on his gravestone? That was his gravestone. Oh, you didn't read this yet. It says, this plaque is dedicated as a memorial to Jean-Baptiste Pomp Charbonneau, whose personal life experience elevated him to national recognition in American history. He began his road of life on an epic journey westward. The youngest person accompanying the Lewis and Clark expedition, Pomp was carried in a cradleboard by his mother, Sacagawea, a Lemhi Sushoni. Following the death of Sacagawea in 1812, young Pomp came under the guardianship of Captain William Clark and was schooled in St. Louis, Missouri. He spent six years in Europe and Africa. While abroad, he learned to speak English, Spanish, German, and French fluently, in addition to several native languages he already knew. During his stay overseas, he accompanied and was hosted by a German royal family royal family, the Wilhelms of Württemberg. He then returned back to the States where he served as Alcalade of San Luis Rey, California. His love for adventure and free spirit brought him full circle back to the natural wonders from whence he traveled as an infant child. As a guide, he taught others to appreciate the natural beauty of this great nation. We commemorate his triumph as a great example of adventure and freedom, a spirit that characterizes the great American West. This looks like a typical Indian grave with a stone on it, and then people from all over the world have put coins there. What's that one? That's that's just a that's an American quarter. There's an, all kinds of different quarters. Let's see. United States. Uh, I don't see any foreign. Well, let's see. What's this? No, that's an American. Well, there's an obsidian heart. That's Canadian. Mm, just mostly American. What's that one? Oh, that's... that's a quarter. That's American. Oh, mostly fish hooks and pennies. coins. Coins. Got an obsidian heart. Shell, hearts. Yeah, I've. Let's see what we got. Dimes. What's this? River shrine. Okay, this, this if, if he needs to go fishing. Oh, oh yeah. here. Well, here, you want to get a picture of me standing by his crib?
looks as though someone left him a what's that bottle of beer and a jug of honey. Where's the honey? Oh wow, a whole j a quart jar of honey. Hmm. There was some here and there was all those beads before. Just across from the grave, we walk across the road and this is the Inskip station. That was a safe house where the settlers could all go in times of Indian attack. And it had actually had shooting ports in it when we first started coming here where they could shoot out. Now all that's left are the ruins of it. Part of the foundation is here and the chimney still stand but it looks as though the shooting ports have all disappeared. From the ruins of this old fort-like building, we chart a course for the Owyhee Canyon. We're going right down to a place where three forks of the Owyhee River come together. We see the Owyhee River far down below us. Okay, now you said you were born and raised around Jordan Valley. I was, I was, uh, I was born just uh, about three miles out of Jordan Valley. On a ranch. On a ranch. Oh yeah, and what'd you raise? Cattle? Or yeah. Uh huh. Sheep? Cattle? Just cattle. Yeah. A yeah. few sheep, but but mainly uh -huh. cattle. And what do you know about the cannon that supposedly was lost in the Owyhee River? Well, that cannon, uh, it, uh, there's a lot of stories on it. Uh, it's up in the rim rock someplace. Uh, it got dumped in the river, and and it's still there. And all, uh, but the old military records say that they retrieved that cannon. Oh, uh, and uh, it was lost crossing the river on a raft. On a raft, the raft oh. tipped over. I'll be darn. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, but they but they they got it back. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> the military wasn't much to be leaving cannons laying around. If they no, could. I don't think they'd want to <laughs> leave a cannon lay there. And how there was um, a place where they kept extra horses down by the river was there uh, to help pull the wagons out of the canyon. Well. Uh, there was a temporary camp at Three Forks. Uh, uh, they 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 were gonna construct a fort there. Oh! At Three Forks, uh, at, down in the canyon at Three Forks, and for some reason they decided they 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 weren't gonna build it, so they moved the fort clear up to a place called Soldier Creek, oh. and, and they actually called that camp on Soldier Creek. Fort Three Forks. Oh, is that right? They named it Fort Three Forks, and it's a long ways from Three Forks. Okay, when we go down there, right on the right-hand side, sort of across from that outhouse that's there now, yeah. there's some, uh, there's, um, looks like maybe an old root cellar or something. Those aren't root cellars. Oh, what the, was? Those, uh, uh, those were, uh, dugouts that the military had there. Oh, like like a gun emplacement or something? No, they weren't weren't gun emplacement. They were actual d dugouts where they where they lived. Oh, yeah. Half above and half below ground uh -huh. or something. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. And if you there's been people dig around in there and find old military uh, buttons and Oh, no odds, kidding. Odds, odds and ends, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. I wondered what those were. Um, well, just in that in that cut, just the other side of it, that's where that slide trail goes down. Oh, okay. And that's what the, that's the that's the the name of it is the slide trail. And that's what you do when you go down. And you right just now. basically slide all the way from the top to the bottom. Well, how about the whiskey they made in that moonshine still? Did they make good stuff? Well, they say they did. <laughs> you you can still see the old. Uh, a lot of the old uh, 
kegs that they lost over the cliff there, packing it up out of there. The, well, I'll be darned. The old, uh, wood, the, the old wood stave kegs and I'll barrel be hoops there. And, and uh, we got right to the top, and and this old cow, she did, didn't want to go on up uh, over the trail there. I grabbed one of them uh, barrel hoops off of one of them old whiskey kegs, and I flipped it at her like this and it hit her in the flank and she jumped and kicked and went over the cliff. Oh, I'll be darned. Uh, th 300 feet. Right? Oh. Wow. Yeah, oh. I've seen them do that. Uh, yeah. Wow. That was we come to the edge of the Owyhee River and dr start dropping down into the canyon below us. As soon as we start dropping down the trail, it winds around with switchback after switchback as we drop elevation down into the river and to the historical place called Three Forks, where the Three Forks of the Owyhee River come together. Switchback after switchback, we get closer and closer to the bottom, and we can look over on the surrounding hills and see some of the old pioneer roads like the old military road where they went, where they uh, hauled mail to Silver City, Idaho through the canyon. And there were extra horses kept down in the bottom to help pull the wagons out. After winding down this bumpy switchback road, we finally reach the bottom. Even a few of the sunflowers are waving their blossom in the breeze. It's said that these blossoms, till they get real big, follow the sun around all day long. When we reach the bottom, we find these dugout houses. They were half above and half below ground. And that's where the military personnel lived, down at the bottom of reef of Three Forks. They lived down here to protect from the road from Indian battles. And I understand there was even one Indian battle fought down here someplace. We look across and see the old hand-built road winding up and out over the canyon's rim. Next, we break out the fishing poles and test the water to see if we can catch one of the bass that swim down here in the warm waters of the Owyhee River. And the bass were biting and biting good. We each caught our limit, which is a limit of five. So we caught 15 bass down here. That is going to make a really nice bass feed. Queen. the biggest one. Yes. Well, we had a good night here, but we got to go this morning. What a place to camp. We're up early the next morning packed up and ready to go. Annette decided to wash her hair and went down and was reaching out a ways to get beyond the moss and fell in the Owyhee River in a fairly deep pool, head first. We see a few tracks of creatures in the night from the night before. On the way out, we see a little group of chuckers right alongside the road. After the chuckers in the canyon, 
we move up on top on the Hawaii Desert, up on top the rim. We see they're starting to round their cattle up, taking them off the Hawaii Desert and back to the ranch. The dogs are doing a lot of work there, some really good cow dogs, and there were cattle for miles here. We figured they were br moving about 300 head down the road that day. Some of them were trotting while others were just walking along, but there were cattle strung out for miles here. <laughs> Thank you.